for the Department of Health and Human Services. As indicated on the uh, agenda, the workshops intended to present information and solicit public comment regarding the proposed enhancement to Medicaid for children um, under the age of 21 who are either in foster care or have a serious emotional disturbance or a serious uh, mental illness. And these enhancements include the coverage of behavioral health services that will be available to support children and families in their home and community. Additional changes proposed are focused on reforms to existing services and programs aimed at increasing access to necessary care while rewarding service providers for improved quality and outcomes. And as some of you may know that uh, the SB 435 passed by the 82nd session of the legislature in 2023 and signed by the governor set aside 15% of revenues collected from uh, a hosp the hospital tax to cover improvements in community-based children's uh, behavioral health, as well as administrative costs. Um, you know, most of you on here probably know that the process for adding services in government are, um, are not always fast and um, in this case have multiple processes, not only the legislative authority to spend the money, but also the Medicaid or CMS process to add a service or change a service. Um, and so um, with, with that in mind, knowing what the unmet needs are in our um, state as it relates to children's behavioral health, um, we are working in alignment with the Department of Justice findings to really begin this process and um, move as quickly as possible so that we're not um, that that we're not sitting on resource when there is unmet need. And so that's the, the purpose of, of coming forward with these workshops. And really, this is the first one of, uh, of, of, of many to engage the community and the providers and the consumers on um, um, really improving children's behavioral health in our state. And with that said, I just want to acknowledge the work and um, efforts of Stacy Weeks. She, along with clinically with, uh, with Ann Polinkowski, really have systematically gone through the services, looked at models from other states, and um, we'll, we'll take you through this initial uh, package of services that we would intend to put forward uh, to get uh, federal approval so that we could then um, add the services and meet improve our ability to meet the needs of children's behavioral health in our state. So with that, Stacy, would, would you like to start? Yes, I would. Thank you, Director Whitley. All right, so I'm going to share my screen and, and pull up the slides for everyone, and we'll get started. There we go. So hopefully everyone can see that okay. Um, let me pull it up from the beginning. And if you have any issues with sound or anything, please let me know. Um, hold on, I'm going to share a different way. There we go. Okay. Can everybody see that okay? Mm -hmm. All right, great. All right. Um, so as Director Whitley mentioned, we're here today to really walk you through some of our, our new plans in Medicaid to address children's behavioral health crisis in our state. Um, we're going to walk through the purpose, the vision, as well as some new services that we are going to be looking to implement, along with ways that we're trying to modernize how we pay for health care and Medicaid to really drive better quality and outcomes for kids. And then I'm going to kick it over to Anne on our team to walk through some of the efforts in state mobile crisis response, as well as the provider training and education that her and her team are going to be helping um, do in the community. So as we build these services, providers have resources and training. Um, and so hopefully once we get them up and going, we will have a provider community to help provide them. And then we'll talk at the end about next steps and um, I'll open it up for discussion. All right, so today's meeting is to, like I mentioned, to announce the new efforts to address the state's children's behavioral health crisis. This, um, this effort is part of the governor's three-year plan, the Nevada Way, which really includes a, a requirement and policy plan to deploy to strategic investments in new mental health services in the state. 
And this meeting here is to solicit feedback on some of these efforts from the public and you all as our community partners and stakeholders. It is also a, the beginning of an effort that we are trying to create a transparent forum to start talking together about implementing these changes to Nevada's behavioral health care system for children. The vision that we've set forth is that Nevada children should all have access to the behavioral health services they need to live and thrive with their families and in their children, with their, or sorry, in their communities. There are certain values we're really trying to focus on and trying to meet this vision. That is that this should be child centered and family focused work as well as community based. I really am another important piece of this is ensuring we have an accountable system of care to serve children and that we are doing a coordinated response, not only at the state level, but also the local level and with community partners. This slide here is a visual of really the new um, package of services that we intend to roll out and implement um, pending um, legislative approval at the next interim finance committee. This is going to be a package of new Medicaid home and community based services for children with serious emotional disorder and serious mental illness up to the age of 21. On the left side here, you see the blue box. That is what we're working on as you know, when children come into the system, we're wanting to make sure that all children get comprehensive screening and assessment for children's behavioral health needs. And that's going to be at the primary care clinic. That will be if they come into the state level, the county level, as well as if they come in at the school level. So we're also going to be looking at ways to incentivize and ensure that children are getting these services at these different settings. And then if a child is screened and assessed for having a serious emotional disorder, we will be they will be eligible for these new services, um, a, a array of services and home and community based package. As you can see, that's that pink box right there. Those are the new or the new package of services for this population. This package will also be available to foster care families and children, and they can access these services as well as children who have dual diagnoses, of, for example, intellectual developmental disabilities. We'll be working with CMS and trying to find ways so families do not have to choose between this package of services and um, the other services that we have for children with IDD. So uh, as you can see, when a child is eligible for these services, uh, the, 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 the rainbow here, the circle around the home are the services that we will be wrapping around the family. The first one here is covering wraparound facilitation services for families and children. And this is really building that child and family team that will be there to help the family navigate and look at what resources and services and supports that they need. And that child and family team will stay with the family and make sure that the child is getting the needs met. And then the other piece is making sure that each family and child has access to individual and family therapy in the home. And that may include telehealth if needed in some areas of our state, as we know that these services are limited. We're also looking at ensuring this population has access to psychosocial rehab services, family and youth supports, which this family and youth supports, peer, peer supports is like a new service. Um, we currently cover peer supports, but not family and youth peer support. So this will be a new service that we'll be adding, as well as adding coverage of planned and, and emergency respite for families and caregivers. caregivers. And on the right side here, you can see the, the blue boxes. These services are already covered, obviously, in Medicaid, but we want to make sure that these services are part of the array of options that families know that they have and that they're able to access. That includes transportation, psychiatric services, medication management, mobile crisis and stabilization services, and eventually we'll be adding youth employment supports for older children in the, in the program. Oops, let me go back. And then the next thing that we're going to be working on in Nevada Medicaid is looking at our, our residential settings and really strengthening the quality and capacity to serve children. There are going to be times where children still need a residential treatment setting. I mean, the goal of a lot of this is to help children stay in their home and community, but there are times that residential treatment is necessary. Um, but the goal should only be that these services are used short term when clinically appropriate and if there are no safe community alternatives due to a child's behavioral health condition. So some of the things that we think are important to invest in is how we pay for these services. So then, then we're going to be doing that through two things. We're going to be doing new Medicaid investments in residential settings as well as different changes to improve quality. The first one is really moving away from what we currently do where we negotiate rates 
um, for every provider, we're just going to set a flat base rate. So every provider that opens a center or has cent a center knows what their rate will be. Um, the flat rate of 800 is what we believe is to be reasonable based on current costs um, in the program for other for current providers. But we're also offering add-ons for $100 for children under the age of nine. This is an area where we, we do lack access for younger children, so we'll be serving We'll be adding on a bonus payment for for uh, residential settings that take um, services for these children. We'll also be adding on a bonus payment of $100 for children with complex needs. Now, complex needs is something we're still working to define, and we will be having a future public workshop to talk about that and get feedback on how we define that. And then the other Medicaid changes that we want to do to really drive quality and outcomes when children do need to be in the residential setting is to look at new quality bonus payments for residential treatment centers that are tied to robust discharge planning, shortened lengths of stay that are also at the same time ensuring that there's successful community transitions for children and low readmissions. And then the other piece here is ensuring that all of our centers are certified as pediatric residential treatment facilities as required by state and federal law and strengthening policies and oversight around discharge planning, admissions, and preventing abrupt terminations and transfers of children. We're also going to be looking at increased ways to increase our monitoring and transparency of data and quality metrics and performance for these centers. And a lot of this we'll be doing online and, and through a dashboard, and we'll talk about that in a second. So the other Medicaid investments and changes that we're looking at for children's behavioral health include covering a new, um, a new setting and provider type, a qualified residential treatment program. And this is really a step down option from the residential treatment setting option. And it's really designed to serve children with serious emotional disorder and serious mental illness who are between the ages of 13 and 20. These are more of our group home settings. Typically, these are going to be under 16 beds, but we have seen in other states that they can be larger. Um, we'll be working and looking at um, national models and seeking feedback as we develop this new program. The other piece that we're very much focused on and really investing a lot of time in is our, our expansion of our school health services statewide. Currently, we do cover a lot of services and school health services um, in the school setting, especially including behavioral health. Um, but what we're seeing is a lot of schools lack access or the ability to bill for these services for a variety of reasons. So we're really looking at ways to increase that um, capacity of schools to provide these services and to bill for them. That includes incentivizing all schools to screen for behavioral health conditions so they can connect families and children with the appropriate need or the appropriate services in their community. This also includes removing the need for the county share for these services. We are going to be picking up the cost of these services, the state cost going forward. So regardless of what county the child lives in, if a school is enrolled with Medicaid, they can bill for these services. We're also going to be increasing rates for individual and family therapy services as part of that package, knowing that today, if we're going to be wanting these services to be available, we really need to be looking at the historic underfunding of these services. And so we'll be doing a rate increase as well as an add-on for these services when they're provided in rural areas and an add-on for in-home services or telehealth in the in-home for the rural areas. Additionally, we're going to be looking at our behavioral support services and psychosocial rehab services and doing rate increases and expanding these services to all children who have serious emotional disorder and serious mental illness up to the age of 21. And for those of you that may not know, we currently cover these services. They are just only available in our specialty foster care program. So this really will be expanding it to a broader um, population and increasing the investments. We're also looking to do rate parity for our inpatient psychiatric hospitals with acute hospital stays for psychiatric services and detox. This is an area we think is very much needed, and we also want to ensure that while we're still invest investing in these home and community-based services, that we're also still investing in ensuring quality services and adequate services for inpatient psych stays. We're also going to be looking at removing prior authorization for any crisis intervention services, and this is going to apply to all ages. Regardless of age, people should be able to access this, these services without prior authorization. Okay. And then just a real quick, D Director Whitley mentioned on this mentioned this earlier that the financing mechanism really goes back to Senate Bill 
435 from last session, which allows Nevada Medicaid to use up to 15% of the revenue from the private hospital tax to pay to cover the cost of administrative um, activities around uh, putting up the tax and running the tax program, as well as any um, remaining funds could be used to improve access to Medicaid behavioral health care services in the community. Nevada Medicaid will leverage these new tax revenue dollars and match them with federal Medicaid dollars. To access these funds for services, Nevada Medicaid will be seeking approval from the state's legislative interim finance committee in April, and the April IFC focus will be on services and these new investments that I just mentioned. And then in June of IFC, we're going to be coming back with some other changes and investments that we need for the delivery system modernization, as well as vendor and staffing support to lift these efforts. All right, Anne, I'm going to hand it over to you. Great, thank you. So for those of you that know me, you know that uh, state or, or mobile crisis response and stabilization services are something that I'm very passionate about. So I will try not to get too long winded um, and just work through what we're doing with youth mobile crisis response and stabilization. So we all know that the best place for our children to be is in their homes and communities when it's safe to do so. Throughout the state right now, there are several entities providing mobile crisis response and stabilization services to our children, adolescents, and young adults, but there's no umbrella or statewide policy or best practice in place to help guide, guide them really at this point. So some of the things that we are looking to do as we move forward with our mobile crisis response and stabilization is to create a best practice policy and guidance for the teams that are out there doing mobile crisis response. We know that that mobile crisis doesn't look the same for adults as it does for youth, and we want to make sure that any mobile crisis team who is providing services to children and families is doing so in a model that is aligned with best practice, that's aligned with system of care principles and values, that really works to keep the youth in the home when it's safe to do so, that helps to avoid out-of-home placements when possible, that's delivered in a way that's developmentally appropriate, that's connected to services and supports for that youth, and that involves family-to-family -family, uh, peer support and youth peer supports. We, I get distracted when all the people join the meeting and I get the pop-up, so I apologize. We are looking at, or we already have actually some enhanced rates in the Medicaid chapter for designated mobile crisis teams. These mobile crisis teams come from CMS in terms of the criteria for them, and it's and it's pretty stringent, which is why there's an enhanced rate for them. So far, we don't have any enrolled designated mobile crisis teams, even though they're allowable. We also have a SPA amendment, right, waiting to be approved, if I got the language right. I'm still trying to learn all the Medicaid language. Is that right, yes. Stacey? Okay. Yes. <laughs> And what we're not a spa out, that, not a spa outing, a spa state plan amendment. Yes, uh, <laughs> you got it. Thank you. So what we're hoping to do in that in that spa amendment is create a crisis chapter, and in that crisis chapter, it would be a new provider type. So in provider type eighty seven, we would look at five different crisis services to include the designated mobile crisis teams, the designated mobile crisis teams within the CCBHC. Mobile crisis teams, intensive crisis stabilization services, and crisis stabilization centers. The mobile crisis teams that I mentioned in the middle will be almost an interim level team underneath the designated mobile crisis teams, where we're going to create provider standards, certifications, uh, training, TA, and then do some quality assurance, right, to make sure that that the teams are doing what they need to be doing and then provide them the TA and support that they need to continue to serve our children and families. I think I got it all. Did I miss anything, Stacey? Nope, I think you're good. And then we have the next slide on the training. Yeah. Okay. So the other the other new thing that we are providing within DCFS, we have created a provider unit. One of the things that we've already rolled out within this unit is our intensive in-home clinical team. This is a team that is working with some of our most complex youth, our most complex behavioral health needs youth and their families in their homes and communities. We are intensively in there in a team um, 
for our youth coming home from higher levels of care. So we are helping that youth transition from an out-of-home placement back into their homes, providing that intensive clinical, psychosocial rehab, connection to services, providing almost a soft landing or a transitional landing for this youth to come home and back into their homes and communities and working with that family and that youth to provide that stability um, and to ensure success and to uh, decrease recidivism, right? So if we can support that youth and family prior to them leaving that higher level of care, bring them into their homes and then stay with them for four, five months or so until they are stable enough and feel like they can decrease to what we traditionally see coming out of a higher level of care, which is medication management, um, maybe a community resource for individual and family therapy. So we've already rolled that out out of this unit. We're also looking at building expertise within this unit to provide support, training, and technical assistance to the community. So we've listed some of the things here on this slide that we are building that expertise in. So mobile crisis response and stabilization, somebody who could answer questions surrounding high fidelity wraparound and intensive care coordination. We have a program up and running as well for infant and early childhood mental health child care consultation where we go into child care centers for youth who are, are exhibiting some behavioral health concerns and provide consultation, work with that provider on how we can support that youth within their classrooms, within their early care and education classrooms, and really looking to decrease the expulsions that we're seeing in early care and education settings. We have some experts in infant and early childhood mental health where, and um, trauma-informed care. So we have a whole gamut of trainings. We're going to continue to build our expertise in that unit. We want to be able to provide those trainings to the community so that we have a trained and supported workforce to provide all of the services that Stacy talked about earlier in this presentation. Thank you, Anne. Yeah. All right, so we're already at next steps and I apologize if I was talking really fast. I was trying to slow myself down. Um, so we do have a couple things ahead of us. Obviously, there's a, like Director Whitley mentioned earlier, and it takes a lot of time and effort to get some of these things underway. So it's one of the reasons we wanted to get started now. Um, so we're going to April Interim Finance Committee to get approval of the services and the re reimbursement changes that I just mentioned earlier. Um, and once that's approved, we can move forward with the implementation. And then we're also looking at scheduling another stake stakeholder workshop in May um, before June IF IFC to announce additional changes in Medicaid and other programs for improving children's behavioral health care. So this is more of the phase one of our efforts. And then in June, like I mentioned earlier, we'll be going and asking for additional resources in addition to vendors and staffing support to stand up a lot of these efforts. And then last but not least, we are going to be looking at establishing a Family and Stakeholder Advisory Committee for implementation this fall. This committee will be really important to advising us and ensuring that we have the family voice at the table and that we have the stakeholders engaged and making sure that we're not missing anything and as we develop policies and procedures and these new programs. So if you're interested in that, you can definitely reach out to us and we'll put more information out in, um, at the May workshop about this effort. We'll also be looking to work with our Office of Analytics at the department to develop a data dashboard where we'll be looking at evaluating all the changes that we're making in 2025 and beyond to see if they're working. It's really important that we stand up these services and that they are actually making the improvements that we want to see for children and families in our communities. Our goal right now, um, as you guys all know, I say this very <laughs> hesitantly because sometimes we say, our effective date is this date and then we can't we have to go through the CMS process so sometimes that can delay it but we are aiming to get most of these up and going by January 1 2025. Um, I think maybe for peer support changes we're hoping to do that sooner but at the minimum we're aiming for January 1 2025. Now some of the service I services I mentioned earlier may take a little more time so just want to mention that some of the stuff we have to go through some additional um, different processes at the federal level and possibly a waiver so i just want to mention that this is our goal but just bear with us as we you know move forward trying to implement this work um 
We also have other changes that I mentioned earlier that we'll be talking about in May that are more the delivery system improvements that we think we need to ensure that children are getting their needs met and that these services are being made available to them. And with that, I will open it up for discussion and I am just gonna stop sharing so I can see you guys. There we go, okay. If you have a question, please raise your hand. And if you if you want to put it in the chat, feel free to do that too if that's easier and more comfortable. Oh, I already see a bunch in the chat. Let's see. So 800 for the entire stay. So it's 800 a day. So the, the first question, is that supposed to be 800 for the entire stay? No, it's our encounter rate. So it's $800 daily rate. Thank you, Teresa. Um, yes. At the end of the workshop, we will be um, posting the PowerPoint and the recording. So, and we will, so you can get download a copy or access a copy. So, we'll make sure you get that. Um, yes, it should not say. So, the psychiatric, someone asked about the last slide where I said pediatric residential treatment facility. Yes, it should say psychiatric. But as you guys may know, that P PRTFs only apply to individuals up to 21. Okay, let's see if there are any the last questions here and then I'll open it up for others. Will that step down type service also be available to youth and families who have court ordered treatment, inpatient treatment? I'll have to follow up on that one. I, I'm certain they can as long as they're not in um and considered in the corrections side of the house. So we'll have to talk about that later. How does the new provider unit interact with CME? Sounds like um, Dan, we'll have to talk more about delivery system reforms at the next meeting, if that's okay. Okay, I'm going to open it up for questions. Julia Rat or Julie Ratty, did you want to go? Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I also did put it in the chat. Oh, okay. I think you just missed. Um, oh. It is the question around provi provider type 87 for the crisis response system and specifically the designated mobile crisis teams. And so my understanding of that rate from other presentations is it's a rate where you can bill in 15 minute increments for crisis response services with an enhanced rate, which is amazing. But in the billing for 15 minute increments, it doesn't create the infrastructure necessary for 24 seven services, but 24 seven services are required in the rate. So when you go on a call, but then you get called back or if you just have downtime because there aren't any calls, the kind of infrastructure you need to maintain the vehicles, the staffing, everything necessary for 24 seven. And what I've seen is in other states is that there's some subsidy or base funding for the infrastructure piece so that you can maintain 24 seven hour services. And then there's the billing on top of that. So I don't think we're gonna have, at least in Washoe, what we're finding is not a lot of enthusiasm for standing up a designated mobile crisis team because that, how do you get to a 24 seven infrastructure when you can only bill for actual time of service? So that's my question. Conversations to get us to there. OK, well, thank you. No, that's an important point. Um, I think we agree with you on that. I, Sarah, I don't know if there's any I don't know of any efforts on our end at this point um, to increase or change reimbursement. But Sarah, I was going to open it up for you if you have anything you want to add, because I know you've been more involved in the mobile crisis side. Sure, thank you so much, Julia. Thank you so much for the question um, and continued discussion and continuing to bring this up. Um, currently, it will be only that code being used, but I think further discussions will um, be helpful. As I always say, and probably many people here, our Medicaid policies are living documents. Um, so as we work to improve our system, we're happy to have those continued discussions. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I'm just going to advocate for those starting because I think we um, have the state and local governments, I think, have prioritized the crisis response system and the build out of that. And that that question mark on the business model of the mobile crisis teams, I think, is the next the next step. Thank you. OK, now that's helpful feedback. We'll go and look at that, especially as we look at what additional funding we have left. We have to also just be mindful of what's left um, in that in that account. Um, otherwise, it could be a budget proposal for session. So but thank you. All right, um, let me see, any other hands up? I'm having a hard time seeing for some reason. I think Anya has her hand up. Okay, Anya, did you wanna go? 
I did. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Anya Earl. I am the president of the uh, Nevada chapter of FFTA. And I know it's been a minute since maybe many of you interacted with the FFTA uh, membership here. We are a collective of agencies that provide specialized foster care for uh, youth in northern and southern Nevada. And so I just wanted to um, speak to how excited we are that so many of these programs are coming through um being able to hear the the programs and the um, opportunities that you're offering to families is really exciting so we're just so willing to work with you um, because we do so much of this work and we're so involved in you know the continuum of care i really love hearing about the post um foster care services that uh you referenced and then as with the DC, DCFS provider unit and then also the peer and family support services that you talked about. I think that's really great. Super excited about that stakeholder advisory committee. So we're looking forward to participating and being um, a partner alongside you and collaborating. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. And just to mention, if I might not have mentioned earlier, we are looking at rate increases for peer supports generally. And so that will be applied to the new, the new services that we're adding. So just wanted to mention that. Great, thank um, you. Yeah. Any other questions from folks? Let me see if I have any other hands up. Dave Doyle, did you want to go? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, just want to echo Anya's uh, statement and we are very excited to be partners in this. And um, I was really pleased to hear that this is the first of a series of workshops because I was first kind of concerned about the short notice, but then I know there's more coming. So that's exciting. Um, something that we may have missed, and I think Nevada needs more development in, is our QRTP system. And I know you mentioned it and touched on it and that there was a flat base rate being developed for RTCs and PRTFs. Is that something you're also considering? And excuse my negligence if I missed it, but as there's a need for few, further uh, QRTP expansion, are you guys looking at a flat base rate for that as well? Or did I did I miss that? Um, I would just want yeah, to add that sorry, to the Yeah, sorry, Dave. Comment. No, you did not miss it. I, I was trying to read my notes. I must have missed it myself. Um, we are looking at a flat rate, a, a rate that everyone will know what they're going to get. Um, we will look at probably some other bonuses, you know, trying to drive quality and, and incentivize and reward providers who are trying to help us meet the needs. So. Um, we will, as we develop that benefit, we'll be doing that like we typically do a Medicaid benefit. We'll have a public workshop on it. We'll kind of show you what we're thinking, get feedback, and then we'll develop it. But I think we're looking at right now, based on what we understand cost and budget and everything, we're looking at, a, I think, $460 rate. But um, we can still have more conversations about add-ons onto that um, that we need to talk about going forward. Thank you so much, Stacey. I yeah. appreciate you. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. Karen, I saw your hand up. Yes, thank you uh, for holding this workshop. And um, I want to commend the group on recognizing the value of family and youth peer support. And Nevada PEP is um, here to work alongside you to stand up that service in Nevada. Um, also, I am curious, years ago, um, we had some trouble with the PSR BST service and not having um, enough guidelines to drive the type of service that was provided. Have we made any um, changes to that service, um, defined that service any differently than, say, maybe eight years ago? I'm going to open that up to Sarah if she can jump in and talk. I know she's been working on that service. Sarah, do you have any comments on that? Sure. Thanks so much, Karen, uh, for the question. I think um, as we grow these benefits, we do want to highlight uh, the quality service delivery. And that's where I think those key stakeholder engagement advisory group meetings will be really helpful. Um, as all of you have experienced, um, and possibly provided psychosocial rehab in the past, we'll definitely look for um, some expertise in how we can ensure quality delivery of these services. Um, as Stacy mentioned, that psychosocial rehab, it may remain a state plan benefit, but within addressing this kind of specialized population of youth, we will look to adding um, quality metrics for providers um, within this group as well. 
um, and ensuring that those services are delivered appropriately. So not specific detail, but um, I think we look forward to improving the quality of that service delivery as we move forward. Thank you. And of course, Nevada PEP would like to participate on the advisory committee. Yeah. Well, Karen, we will sign you up. <laughs> and um, also just back to what Sarah was saying, you know, all of these investments are really important, but part of this is quality. So if we want to get the outcomes we want, that's a big piece of it for us. So very much appreciate you bringing that up and, um, and it will be part of our conversations as we start to develop all these benefits. Um, I'm going to open it up to Sandy. I see your hand up. also FFTA just want to speak to the day treatment um, I don't see it in the slides and hopefully it's one of the services that's being looked at um, it's definitely a community-based service serving SED youth and um, we're definitely keeping kids out of higher levels of care hospital settling settings residential treatment um, we haven't had a rate increase in the day treatment. I think it's related to the data, but since 2001, we've been in business since in, in day treatment since 2001, and we've we had a rate decrease in 2006. But since our inception in 2001, we haven't had a rate increase, and so we're at the crisis point, and we know that we're making a difference in the community. So as we're looking at this, that's definitely something that I'll try to keep on your radar. Okay, no, that's really good feedback. Thank you. We'll look at that and look at the rates and see if there's some room and, and some improvement that we can afford right now with this funding. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Elizabeth Flores. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Liz Flores and I'm the director of Washoe County's Juvenile Services. And thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I'm not sure to what extent any any of what is being presented um, intersects or overlaps with. Um, I'm going to read this because I'll forget the name. The Omnibus Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023, where um, states can opt into funding or extending Medicaid for incarcerated youth pre, pre and post disposition. Um, so before I'll say much further, I, I'm not sure if that's a different conversation or if that belongs here. Thank you. Yeah, no, Elizabeth, I'm glad you brought that up because it is something we are we are looking. We actually have to implement this, um, those services um, for incarcerated youth um, pre-release. And so uh, we have a separate team working on that issue. And it, if it's OK with you, we, maybe we could follow up after this um, and, and talk to you more about because we're going to need to be working hand in hand with you guys and others um, on standing that up by January 1, apparently. The CMS is holding to that timeline and it's very tight, but um, definitely we need to have more of a conversation on that. So thank you for raising it. Thank you. All right. Um, Karen, is your hand still up? Did you have another question? So I do. I forgot okay. to mention no <laughs> mobile crisis. Uh, mobile crisis response is one of the most valuable services um, for families who need help um, de-escalating a situation. And we are very concerned about uh, families being told to call the police. A police response is not an appropriate response. And I just want to commend Anne and and the team for knowing that we have to incorporate the national standards and best practice into our mobile crisis. And I know um, by attending some other Medicaid meetings that they're pretty stringent standards. Um, so I hope that we can provide some good technical assistance and support to get us there in Nevada so that we ultimately avoid the police response. Anne, did you want to add anything to that? I see, I see you nodding, but. No, I, I agree, Karen, 100%, not an appropriate response. And in terms of the technical assistance, that is my goal with that provider unit as well, is to build that expertise there who can do that training and technical assistance for the mobile crisis teams. Yep. Thank you. 
And Brian, I see your hand up. Brian Link. Yeah, let me see. Did I get unmuted there? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I'm Brian Link. I'm from Resource Family Services. We're outpatient therapy. Um, and I know there's some new services that you're including in this. And I'm just wondering is because I know this is phase one, but are there policies, are there practices developing or already developed for new services that were proposed? Um, we're st that's part of the advisory piece. We'll be working on that and having public workshops to get feedback on the policies as we develop them. We also are working closely with HMA. They're our consultant on evidence-based practices and looking at national standards. So just stay tuned, I think, on more of that and definitely want some of your feedback if you have any on those. HMA, you said we're consulting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Health Who's management. The They're health management associates. <laughs> Um, okay. they're, they have, um, they're mostly Medicaid experts, um, and we were contracting with them right now for children's behavioral health, um, for some of these services and developing them, but we will be bringing that back to all of you in future public workshops for feedback, um, and taking comment like we typically do when we develop new benefits and services. And I'd also like to be on advisory board or some part of that to, okay. to help. Yeah, we'll we'll come up with a process for because we like how many members and all those pieces. So we'll we'll present some of that next time. But thank you. That sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I don't see any other hands. I'll go back to the chat. Stacy, one of the questions in the chat came Thanks. from Mary Spooner. <laughs> um, rural communities in Clark County don't usually have access to the services you're discussing. Um, with these expansion efforts, what effort will include the rural counties and uh, communities for children that are struggling? So that's a good question. It's one of the reasons I think we need to talk more about delivery system. Um, that's some of the things that we're going to be bringing forward next time when we meet. Um, but a big piece of this is actually covering these services, which we do not cover today. And we think that that will help drive some of this workforce. Um, a lot of it will have to do with um, our ability to set good rates, and that's why we want to make sure that we are asking for appropriate amount of funding to do this work. Teresa, are there other questions that I missed? Um, there were some questions about licensure, and will that still occur at HCQC? So for the QRTPs and the PRTFs, yes, that licensure will remain with DPBH at HCQC. Um, Mary responded, thank you. Getting providers in uh, rural communities is challenging. I think that's what Stacy was speaking to. We're trying to build the services and readjust the rates and hope that the providers will go to the rural communities and help provide the services. Um, there's a lot of things. So if I'm missing something, shout out, raise your hand. <laughs> I'm trying to scroll through all of these because some of them I tried to answer in the chat. Are we missing anybody's question? Yeah, oh, the last one, basic training would be getting increased rates. Um, and so as, as part of that um, psychosocial rehab service increase and expansion, and it'll be available broader, broadly. The other thing I would just mention on that point about rural communities, that's one of the reasons we are adding add-on bonuses where we can um, to rates. So that way it encourages um, providers to serve rural children in rural areas and also looking at making sure telehealth is available and and trying our best to utilize those resources more. All right, let me see. We have another hand up, I think, too. Or I thought we did. Yes, uh, good afternoon. This mm -hmm. is Chris Empey, mental health counselor hey. at Washington County Juvenile Services. It's great to hear you know, all the activities taking place to increase children's mental health. We all know it's needed. Um, Stacy, you mentioned plans to expand services available to um, to other children that are available in foster care. Is that specifically the 1959 services that you're talking about? And it relates to Brian Gustafson's question in the chat. Does it imp yeah. does do these activities impact? 1959 services that's one question i have another after that yeah i'll start with that and then we can go to your next one i'm gonna put back in the chat of the visual so you guys can click on it and we can look at it together if that's helpful so i thought it would click 
if it would let me. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Um, so this visual here, if you look at it, a lot, some of those services are currently in our 1915I today, right? Yeah. So psychosocial rehab. Our point of this is to take what we currently have as our 1915I and expand it. So add more services to it that should have that we couldn't afford before that we can now afford. Again, if we could do everything, we would, but we're trying to be very thoughtful about making sure that these kids get these services. So we're expanding access to 1915I, but making that service not just for foster care, but for every family, regardless if the child is in foster care or not, that is struggling with serious emotional disorder. Does that help, Chris? That's the exact question I was asking. <laughs> Sorry if I didn't frame it correctly. No, I think so. Yeah, great. so that's that's great to hear. Those services are will be expanded. Um, and then the second question has to do with intensive in-home services. Um, so um, I'm also on the Washington County Children's Mental Health Consortium. We had a presentation last month from Magellan, who received the um, the uh, care coordination contract, and they talked about their their activities with respect to increasing in intensive in-home services. How and you mentioned those. How will the, those dovetail? Because those so appear to be for are, um, on the managed are, care. Yeah, they're side. separate. They're ARPA okay. funded. They're not Medicaid funded, and we can't match that. But what we can do if a, if they want to build a network of providers that want to bill us directly, we can pay them. But they are not eligible under Medicaid because we did not go through the Medicaid door to develop that program and like establish it under CMS guidelines that we can't directly pay them for those services, but they will be funded through ARPA funding. And by the time we get these stood up, you know, it may be like the timing on all this. So I think that's just something to point out is that these services are not going to be automatically available. It takes us, unfortunately, sometimes six to nine months or more, as some of you have been waiting for a lot of things I know. Um, so but we're, that's one of the reasons we wanted to start now, because we feel like it's already April and we need to get going if we want to get to January 1 at all for some of these services. OK, great. Thank you. And then more <laughs> of a comment, um, as Sandy Arguello was saying, um, you know, being part of the consortium for years, advocating for system of care values and principles, you know, that full continuum of services should include day treatment, intensive <laughs> um, outpatient, as well as partial hospitalization. So. You know, just a plug for that because we have limited providers here in the north um, in those realms, and those services are greatly needed to keep kids from, you know, escalating in levels of care. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. And I think your point, since we do cover those services, but my, I think what you're saying is there needs to be more investments in them. Is that kind of the point? Okay, thank you. That's good feedback. Thank you. All right. Um, Teresa, did I miss anything in the chat? <laughs> The Britt Young is asking the DCFS provider unit that you mentioned in your slideshow, is this just a step down model for youth coming home from an RTC or is the support also available for families just that just need more intensive supports? Anna, I'll let you take it. Yeah, yeah we're looking we're looking at both right now so we have started with the step down and the transition out from the higher levels of care with the intention of of looking at those youth who are at risk of an out of home placement and being able to support that youth in their home. We're, we're working right now to see how it's different than what mobile crisis response can do and the stabilization pieces of mobile crisis response because they can be in there for 60 days. We want mobile to be able to do mobile's work um, and figure out where we fit in there. And I do think there is a role and we will fit in there. We just aren't quite there yet. So we rolled out starting one way um, with the intention of figuring out the other as well. So thank you for that question. And then Stacy, you have two hands up. Oh, okay. Um, Julia Raddy, do you want to go? If you're okay and ready for a second, a second shot. Yeah, second go for hand. it. <laughs> All good. Yeah. But since both Anne and Stacy, you're you're both up. I, I, I apologize. I'm I'm authentically struggling with this. So Julia Raddy, Northern Nevada Public Health. Um, and what I'm struggling with is the alignment of the business model side of mobile crisis with the DCMTs and the rates that go with that, and the best practice model of children's mobile crisis, which is a longer term intervention, at least in the way that we currently do it with DCFS. And so what I'm trying to wrap my head around, I understand that there's, you know, CCBHCs have their mobile crisis team, and I think the designated mobile crisis teams are intended to stand up new providers who want to be in the mobile crisis business. Where did the DCFS 
children's mobile crisis teams fit into this? Is this the business model for the expansion of those teams and their model, which is a much longer than just that immediate crisis stabilization? You know, it's that 30 to 60 days model. So many speak people have spoken so eloquently how that mobile crisis piece is such an essential part of the services that families need. But I'm just having a hard time connecting the dots of how we match that business model with that best practice model. So Julia, if I, I'll answer the best practice model piece, which you're right, it's it's two phases that are separate and distinct, right? So the response phase, which is that initial 72 hours, that initial crisis, and I didn't say it before, and I always say it, and I'm so sorry I forgot it, but crisis is defined by the youth and family, right? It's defined by the family, it's defined by that child, and it's unique and individualized for that child and family. So it's not a rubric, it's it's not a checklist, it's anyone who calls in who wants that service and is in crisis by their own definition. I meant to say that earlier, glad I got to slip that in. Thank you for letting me move sideways for a second. So you've got that 72 hour crisis where you're responding to that initial crisis and stabilizing that initial crisis, doing that safety soothing plan, all of those pieces in that first 72 hours. Then there's a second phase to a mobile response and stabilization, which is the stabilization pieces where you are in that home more intensely working with that youth and family to continue that stabilization because the crises don't always go away in 72 hours. So it allows for us to be in there for another eight weeks or so, 60 days or so, ensuring that the family and that youth is stable, that they have the resources that they need, that we've connected them to resources for ongoing um, so that we're not in a, in a crisis cycle. Because if it's only that 72 hours and that's not enough, and we just send to an, an outpatient in the community ongoing at that point, we often see those youth come back through. So that's why we have the two phases. So that's the best practice model. I don't know that I can answer your business model piece. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, mute, Julia. Sorry, I love that you just laid that out so perfectly, right? Because that is exactly what we want. We have it to a limited degree with our current DCFS mobile crisis teams and that they exist, but it's not adequate capacity to meet the need. And so even in 50, 15 minute increments with the rate 87 in that first 72 hours, like can you just keep billing for 72 hours on what's needed for that family? And then can you bill with rate 87 or is it a different funding source to do that continued in home stabilization that the family de defines as crisis? How does the business model match is, is really my question, Stacey. I'm gonna be honest, this is not an area that I work on as much. So I don't know if Anne or someone from DCFS or Sarah can chime in, but I, I'm not gonna to try to, I think it's a lot, I do think this is something we need to figure out though. So I'm glad you're raising it. So okay. Sarah and I have had a conversation about some potential billing options for that stabilization piece, because we also want to make sure that it's happening, right? And so right now, if you go into the home and it's an individual session or a family session, there's nothing to tell us that it's part of the mobile response and stabilization part, because you move out of the codes that we traditionally use for mobile and into more traditional codes, which then also impacts um, our, our yearly limits. Right. So Sarah and I have been talking about how we how we do that. Sarah, did I overstep and get in your space with that answer? No, I it's fine that everyone's in my space about these answers because we need to figure this out, as Stacy mentioned. Um, so I think it's a little bit of both. Um, definitely that 15 minute code, that H 2011 code under PT 87 is utilized for crisis intervention services. A lot depends on the plan moving forward with the response. What services are going to benefit that youth, that family? Um, is it traditional services under like a provider type 14? Um, would it be under this new area of services that we're going to have for this specific population? So I think further discussions will happen. We don't have any nailed down specifics about that, but I think it's um, a little bit of both of that. Okay, so then my one just request or caution mm -hmm. as we're headed to IFC in particular, 
is that the legislative body has heard a lot of presentations now about this this crisis system of some place to call, someone to come to you, and somewhere to go. And there have been asks. I just don't want the legislature to get the impression that the package that we are foot putting forward is going to cover the cost of mobile crisis 24 seven. No, I, that's because not what not. Yeah. No, nothing yeah. in the package that we're providing is asking for money for that right now, because there's a bigger conversation here that needs to happen about our mobile crisis system in the state. So it's just yeah. a bubble on the rainbow circle. So I, I just no, I appreciate that. I appreciate the feedback and help on that. Um, but no, I think this is a bigger issue that definitely is important to all of us. But again, this is a phase one. And I don't think if we we would need a lot. I mean, we're trying our best with what we have to um, to, to start to build out an array of services. Thank you very much. Um, what do we have? I know we have another hand up and I can't see your name. It um, says Angela, but no last name. Oh, hi, Angela. Go. Angela <laughs> Quinn, my first, sorry guys, I should have put my last name. Um, it's okay. I didn't, and I don't know that I missed it. Do, do you have an apparatus or do you intend to have an apparatus for youth and group therapy? We have individual and family therapy. So Sarah, I make sometimes I don't speak all the language, but Sarah, that is includes youth and group, right? Therapy, individual and family. Individual and family therapy we've talked about. Um, and um, Angela, are you do you have maybe some more specifics you could provide about the question? Yeah, so if we had a cohort of 16 year olds that we wanted to put into a group yep. setting, um, and I don't want to get into the proclivities of FQHCs, but, you know, we can do some things under CHWs. Mm -hmm. But uh, have, have you thought about, um, is there a mechanism that groups could go into play with youth? And then, of course, self-servingly, how would that affect FQs? But uh, Um, I think this is Sarah, sorry. I think I would have to think a bit more on that. I think when we talk about our individual and family therapy services, that is, we're looking at those increases across provider types um, and certainly identifying how FQHCs may play a role in that. I, is, and I'm not an FQHC expert, but um, I'm not sure that group therapy is an available service under FQHCs, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Teresa, do you have this one or do you want us to follow up? Angela, we might need no, to follow I, up. I think we need to follow up, not just on the FQHC side of things, but I think we need to talk about, I, I don't think group therapy was outlined in our package yet, or I think we need to have that conversation. I think we're very focused on the individual child and fa family component. So we need to talk about what that looks like. So Angela, more to come, but thank you for raising that. Brandon, I see your hand up. Hi, yes, this is Brandon Ford, uh, Best Practices Nevada. Um, I've been sitting on a couple advisory councils and things uh, for the DFS and uh, Clark County Children's Behavior Health Alliance or something. And um, I'm just listening to some of the issues issues coming up and uh, things that they're having uh, problems with uh, that they noted was prior authorization and testing for a lot of the, the foster youth. Um, they were talking about long wait lists, um, times just trying to get kids into treatment, um, that some of these wait lists were years long you know, where they're just like, I, I'm not going to be able to get you in um, and just trying to support those providers and those psychologists. Uh, we don't have that many here in Nevada. Um, and then we have even less that are taking Medicaid. Um, and I think some of those issues, they were even more reluctant to participate when uh, the prior authorizations and things for those tests were um, difficult to obtain. I think that causes a uh, kind of a clog in the pipeline for the appropriate treatment, or it leads them to doing the minimal treatment, not always what may be the best treatment because we can't test the kids and, and find that out. 
Um, I was wondering if there was something that we could look into to try to ease that burden somehow, or to uh, just support the psychologists and those providers that will uh, willingly test these children. So you're you're primarily bringing up the issue of having the administrative burden of billing Medicaid because the prior authorization and, and the the kind of the the barrier that presents. I just want to make sure I'm tracking. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can look at that, but we have to remember if I remove every PA, I won't have a budget left. So I just want to be clear that sometimes PAs are an important piece of our program. We can't, and we also have to be careful of ensuring that everything we cover is medically necessary and meets all the requirements. So we can look at it, but I also just want to be mindful that removing a PA is not always um, the, the end, it just can't always be the end solution because we have to have a check in the system too on the services. So I just, we can look at data on it and see what's going on. I think that would probably be a good start. I'm, I'm open to, we're open to having the conversation and think about better ways, but I just always want to be mindful of like PAs, while they are a pain in all of our butts, they do play an important role in our system sometimes to ensure that children are, that we're not paying for things that we shouldn't be because there is fraud in our system as well. So just throwing that out there and just right. being honest about where we're at on some of that. And maybe it's an allowance. Just give them a few tests, you know. Uh, yeah, and year. then have a PA. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, because again, I don't want to test every kid for everything out there possible. But you know, I think uh, a lot of them aren't getting the tests that they they may need, um, especially when you're dealing with the neurodiverse community, FAS, and mm -hmm. um, you know some of those things. So. Okay. Thank well, you. no, thank you. We'll look at some of the data around the uh, PAs on that. Um, Julia, is your hand back up? I just want to make sure I didn't miss you. Maybe, Julia, I don't know if you heard me. Okay, maybe you accidentally left your hand up. Um, all right. Is there, are there any other questions I might have missed? Karen Teacher, how's her hand up? Karen, did you want to go? So I think Brandon um, brought up some good points. I'm curious now, and I don't know if I missed it because everything on my screen was very small, um, but do we have eligibility criteria for this package already um, developed? Yes, we're doing children with SED, SMI up to age 21 and foster care kids. Okay, with, I mean, they foster care kids with SED. No, nope, all foster care kids. Oh, all foster care kids. So one of the problems over the years trying to get a services is children cannot get an SED. Um, it's it's not a diagnosis, but an SED label or whatever, yeah. determination, right? Yeah. So. Um, you know, families have waited for a very long time for our current wraparound services because they don't have that SED determination. And something's got to be done about that um, in order for this to work. Yep. I mean, at some point we have, there's federal rules around some of this too. Like I can't open up a whole home and community-based package to all children that you know, it has to have some diagnoses. So we can look at maybe certain conditions that allow them early access to the benefits. I mean, we have been thinking about that for um, autism and other services, but I just want to be realistic that we have federal requirements as well we have to meet to get funding. Well, I understand meeting the criteria, but if we already know that's a problem, then we really probably need to front end how they're going to get that SED determination. They can and get it from their physician. I mean, I don't, I mean, we can talk about that some more too. Yeah, it to just isn't working. So that that's a problem. And I think Ann knows uh, that that's been a problem over the years. So maybe you have some more technical input, Ann. <laughs> it is definitely a problem, Karen, and I will add it to my list of something to work on. Thank you. So I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, I was just saying about the private rates. 
I get, I mean, again, it's, if we had all the money in the world, we'd pay, there would be no reason not to pay people private rates, but it's a taxpayer funded program. So I just want to be remindful of like, we are, if we overspend our budget and we cannot afford it, then the people, we will have to cut the program. So that is always going to be Medicaid, unfortunately. Um, and I wish there was a way that we could say providers, please participate, but we'll pay, we're trying to pay better. That's what a lot of these efforts are for. But again, this is a taxpayer funded program and Nevada has limited amount of taxes and revenue. So I just want to have that reality check and that we're doing the best we can with what we have. And if, you, if folks want more, go, go to the legislature and please ask. We are always happy to implement more rate increases when we have more money. All right, um, let me see. We have any other hands up? All right. Any other? Oh, there's one more. Sh Sherilyn? Yeah, okay. thank you. Sherilyn, right now, Sherilyn. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Sherilyn Moore, Wood Regional Behavioral Health Coordinator. Uh, just a quick question. I don't know if this is really going to you know, fall in line, but I'm thinking future thinking, and it's something Karen kind of brought to are those diagnoses. Um, we're already short with workforce when it comes to um, licensed professionals. I know social work is working hopefully this year on a compact with other states so we can get more here. I don't know if that's something that this group or you guys are going to be supporting and helping to advocate for to bring some more professionals into this state, uh, especially in our rural region, which is what I really kind of um, support and work with. And then secondly, is this uh, program and what we're building right now going to fit into the MCO out in our rural region when 2026 comes around? Both very good questions. Um, so I can say that a big focus of the governor's uh, three-year plan is workforce. So that is, you know, I think honestly, it's the chicken and the egg, right? Like which one do you, or do you build it? Do they come? All those different things. So there's, I think just to say, I don't think that this one thing that we're doing here is going to address all of our workforce issues. I think there's a multitude of things that not just Medicaid needs to do, that other areas are working on, that we're all trying to work on the workforce issues. So I know that's a big priority for the governor, and I think you can look forward to more initiatives around that coming soon. I just can't speak to any of that, but I know that is, he's put that in his, his plan and it's something that we are very much committed to because it's affecting everything that we do. You know, we're held to a standard and Medicaid to provide services and we don't have providers and we're trying our best to meet the needs. So it is very important to us. So it, it definitely is on our list. It's just sometimes it's it's I think something I don't know right now what all the answers are, but we it is definitely an issue that we are looking at. And I don't think that this package here is designed for that. There are other things that we're going to be doing in Medicaid and other areas essentially to address workforce. Um, and then your other question had to do with managed care. Right now, this population primarily is in both. Um, it's some are carved out, some are not. Um, the delivery reform questions, I think we want to bring up at, at the next workshop to talk about some of the issues that we think we need to work through. But if a child is in managed care, these services would be available um, to that child and that family. So just to be clear, and if we go statewide, that would be the same for them as well. Thank and, you, Stacey. Yeah, you're welcome. Angela, did you have your hand back up? I wanted to kind of give a shout out to you, to Director Whitley, because I've been doing this for two decades, and this is probably the most progressive thing I've heard. And I hear everybody that things could be better, um, and I get that, but I don't think I've heard anything this bold in terms of trying to sort of change the landscape. So um, my compliments to you and your team, because I think it's going to make a difference. I don't think we understand how yet. But um, and I don't even think FQHCs are going to do a lot with it. But I just think it's it's bold and my compliments to you and to to Richard and the team. So thank you. Thank you, Angela. Well, we'll stay in touch because I want FQHCs to be part of it. So thank you. Um, any other questions or thoughts? Again, this is a conversation. Please know that this is not the last time we will gather. <laughs> So it, it get, you know, there's so much we have to work on, but this is the first step and we're hopeful that we can move forward um, here soon. All right, any last minute hands? Chris, I saw you wave. I guess that's not a hand. Okay. It was a wave, it wasn't oh, okay. a question. Just goodbye. Okay, I was like, Good was to that see a everybody on, the, on this meeting. Oh yeah, it is nice to see everyone's faces. Oh, I see Lacey, did you have a, a question or comment? 
Or did no, I say I, I'm sorry. I don't. I think it was like a temptation thing. Oh, <laughs> I that was funny. I didn't mean to. Thank you. This was great. Yeah. Appreciate it all. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Carly, did you have a question? No, I'm sorry. I was trying to react and hit the wrong button. Oh, that's Thanks. funny. Okay. Well, I'll give everyone back some time um, in their in their day. Um, but again, thank you so much for taking time. And we will post this online and we'll post the presentation. And please keep an eye out for the workshop in May and we'll keep we'll keep talking. But very much appreciate all the feedback. And we will definitely, especially some of the things around day treatment, we'll do some thinking on that and mobile crisis. So thank you again and have a good day.